संस्कृत से निकली हुई है या संस्कृत से जुड़ी हुई है उन सबके भविष्य का उसका भविष्य का युद्ध है यदि ये युद्ध में हम सफल नहीं होंगे तो हमारी संस्कृति इस विश्व से खत्म हो जाएगी विश्व विश्व से जो ये संस्कृति खत्म हो जाएगी ये सारी संस्कृतियों की माता है ये खत्म हो जाएगी तो फिर दुनिया में कुछ नहीं बच सकता इसलिए मैं अपने शब्द समाप्त करता हूँ राजीव जी का वंदन और महारिषि इक्कीसवीं शताब्दी के श्री राजीव मनोहरा मैं आपका स्वागत करता हूँ नमस्कार हम तो ट्रेडिशनल संस्कृत पढ़े हैं राजीव जी ने ट्रेडिशनल क्या है वो भी पता है और विदेशों में क्या चलता है वो भी पता है गणेश जी का चूहा होता है वो बड़ा खतरनाक होता है <laughs> भीतर जाकर के भेद ले आता है सही ढंग से अपनी महान संस्कृति को रक्षा रक्षित कैसे की जाए वो बहुत अच्छी तरह से जानते हैं और एकल वीर भी है वेतन विदेशों में लड़ना आसान नहीं क्योंकि सारी संस्था है उनके पीछे भी पड़ सकती है और इसलिए हम इसको एकल वीर कहते हैं और बड़े से उन्हीं की भाषा में वो इतने प्रेम से उत्तर देते हैं जो लाजवाब होते हैं संस्कृत का अध्ययन करने के बहाने किस प्रकार हमारी संस्कृति की व्याख्या का अधिकार हमसे छीना जा रहा है यह इस पुस्तक की मूल अवधारणा है राजीव जी की पुस्तक को पढ़ने के बाद ये दो ही पंक्तियाँ ध्यान में आती हैं गैरों से कहा तुमने गैरों से सुना तुमने गैरों से कहा तुमने गैरों से सुना तुमने अरे कुछ हमसे भी कहा होता कुछ हमसे भी सुना होता लगातार आक्रमण को सहने के बाद भी अपने आप को जीवित रखने वाली भारतीय संस्कृति के बौद्धिक क्षत्रिय श्री मल्होत्रा का इस पुस्तक की रचना के लिए कोटि कोटि धन्यवाद नाव आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट श्री राजीव मल्होत्रा टू डिलीवर हिस्स की नोट एड्रेस राजीव जी हम सब आपको सुनने के लिए उत्सुक हैं आइए नमस्कार स्वामी जी नमस्कार डॉक्टर राकेश भंडारी जी राकेश भंडारी जी डॉक्टर भंडारी जी सीनियर आई एम वेरी ग्रेटफुल फॉर ऑल द हॉस्पिटैलिटी एंड सपोर्ट फ्रॉम इंडस यूनिवर्सिटी which is now like a home to me for the last few years 
and therefore it's a very suitable place to release this book also. In the car, when they picked me up yesterday at the airport, I asked what should I say in Hindi, I can say in English, so the decision was that I was going to say that the time is YouTube, so you have to be YouTube friendly. So, I will talk about it. I will explain something about it. I will explain something about it. आजकल के जमाने में एन आर मिक्स हिंदी इंग्लिश आई थिंक आई थिंक यूट्यूब में कुछ थोड़ा सा भी हिंदी भी डालनी चाहिए राइट सो अबाउट ट्वेंटी बीस एट्टी परसेंट का हिंदूज बट देर नॉट रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस इन हिंदूज एंड देर नॉट गोइंग टू डिफेंड हिंदूज दिस जस्ट बी हिंदूज फॉर नेम से आई वुड से 25% of Indians are really solid Hindus in the sense they are practicing, they understand it, they, this, is, this is their primary identity. Otherwise, identity may be, if you ask somebody what is your identity, he may say, I'm a cricket fan, I'm a Bollywood lover, uh, I'm a you know, upper class person, lower class person, caste identity, you know, I like this or that fashion. They, they have many ways of identifying. I'm a technocrat like that. But I think very few will say, feel that being dharma is primary identity, primary. There are many other secondary identities. And very few are willing to take the risk, stick their neck out and defend. So I would say about maybe one in four persons is really Hindu dharmic in the true sense, not symbolic in the body card media. Christmas ka bhi diya. Mithai bhi or Christmas tea bhi laga diya. Valentine Day bhi laga diya or Lodi bhi laga diya. Not like that. But people who are really Hindu dharma. Not secularized Hindus. But Hindu Hindus. Maybe 25 percent. And another 25 percent the opposite extreme who are very clearly anti-Hindu. When you say something about Sanskrit or Vedas or dharma, they say it is communal. So, in the middle we have 50 percent left. This 50 percent are the confused middle. Majority of Indians are confused about this issue. They go this way, they go that way. Even their voting pattern is fluctuating. And what they think of all this depends who they are talking to. Maybe privately they are one way, publicly they are another way. In front of this person they talk like this, somebody else they talk like that. Now this 50 percent confused middle is my target market, my target market. Because it's so big, they are the ones who need guidance. The 25 percent who are already solid, they are already solid. They will benefit from my book because they will know how to argue. Not in their personal life, but in their public discussion, they can use these arguments to make arguments better. And the 25 percent who are anti, it's a waste of time. I cannot expect that they will change. The reason I debate them is not to change their mind. I don't expect that. But to show to the 50 percent how you debate with them. Don't run away from them. And also to show to the 25 percent who are protecting the dharma, how to debate with the opponents, what they are like, what is their strength, what is their weakness, how to debate with them. But the real target who I want to influence are the middle 50 percent confused people. So I write my primary target are westernized, anglicized, Googleized Indians, <laughs> YouTubeized India. That is the future will go one way or the other depending on which way they go. That is people will lose it quickly. They were part of the 25 percent Hindus. Now they have slipped in one generation, they have slipped to the middle ground, they could go either this way or that way. And rapidly they are slipping 
pass towards the end use. So this is the place we have to engage in. So we have to engage them in, in a language and metaphor and style, the way they can understand. It's very important. Otherwise, we are just talking to each other out in like-minded people. Actually, I don't go to too many like-minded meetings. I go to the unlike-minded people. So that is where we have to debate. That is where the opportunity comes. So, today is Republic Day. And it's a good time to reflect, reflect on nation patriotism. It's great that for almost 70 years we've been independent. But I would provoke you to think that our independence has been mainly political independence and lately financial economic independence. But we are not intellectually independent. Our education system still is what the British developed, the history they developed. It's Aryan theory, Aryan tributary divide, this idea of caste system, all kind of things have been created in the colonial era. The way we study our history, how we date our texts, this whole idea of human rights, all these kind of things are recent. Day before yesterday, I was in Shri Shri Ravi Shankar's ashram and Shri Shri Ji launched my did a book event for me in front of 5,000 people. Big grand event. Then I went to a conference room where inner circle, the senior most people, they wanted to have me talk and discuss. And I told them I want to invite all kind of people for question answers, including people who disagree, especially people who disagree. I like that. So in the Q&A, there is one young woman who wanted to really argue about human rights violations of Vedas and Hindus, and Sanskrit violates Northeast, people in the Northeast don't want it, and this all kind of stuff like that. So one of the questions, one of the issues we discussed afterwards, because we didn't have enough time, it is very important for you to know. There is a civilization, Western, whose basic ethics is human rights. In dharma, it is human responsibilities. What are your responsibilities towards yourself, family, community, all human beings, nature, animals, cosmos, environment? What are your responsibilities towards all these? So a society where people basically are saying how do I serve all these different levels? Not what do I get out of them? It's a different society. So I mentioned to them that look, the reason this ashram is so harmonious. Nobody goes around saying what's my right to eat? What, how much food am I entitled to? What's my right for this? What's my right for that? Nobody is hiring lawyers to litigate and sue people to get their rights. Everybody is with the power of hardware serve. So if you have a society where the individual unit, which is the building block, has this power of dharma, what is my dharma, what do I do for my dharma? You, you build a whole community of harmony, diversity and harmony. On the other hand, if you have a society where there is greed, selfishness, too much individualism, everybody trying to fight for his rights over others. Then what you have is this vote banking. Everybody saying, how do we form a cluster and beat the other group? We get quota more than them. Politicians come and say, I'll organize you into your own vote bank, you vote for me, I'll get you a better deal. The whole thing is fragmenting, 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 fighting, fighting, fighting. It's a recipe for disaster, beating each other up. This is the calamity we are facing. So, so this attack, this infiltration of Western ideology, whether it is Marxism, whether it is human rights, whether it is Aryan theory, casteism, 
These are casteism is an import because we had jatis and varna, but there wasn't this kind of uh, animosity that I have to meet those guys. The reason I'm poor is those people. It wasn't there. So this type of thing is convincing me that we are still colonized. We are still colonized. We are not fully independent. Even though this is Republic Day, we have to ask ourselves: Are we really properly independent? In the area of the study of our civilization, the name given to this discipline is Indology. The name was given by British people 200 years ago. And so, the cover of this book, which I'm launching today, and we have copies available outside, and the, the image at the bottom is a sculpture from Oxford University. One of the big chapels on the wall is this sculpture, and, it, and this is about a famous East India Company judge in Calcutta. His name was Sir William Jones in the 1790s. And this is called Sir William Jones and the Pandits. These are Pandits sitting on the floor, and he's giving them dictation. It shows he's giving them dictation. Actually, he was sitting and therefore learning from them. But in the sculpture, he goes when they put it up in England, they show that they were sitting at his feet learning from him. And it says, he gave the Hindus their laws. Which means, Hindus didn't have any laws, he gave them their laws. Yeah, they must be uncivilized people. So he's teaching them their laws. He cut and paste some Manu Smithi and different Smithis from here and there, put some distortions came up with some hodgepodge British ideas of laws, told the Hindus that these are your laws. I'm here to teach you your laws. So the Adhikar, as Adhikar of who interprets Hindu law was grabbed by him. So since then, the field of Indology has been there for 200 years or more. To, for Westerners to interpret our Sanskrit and our Sanskriti, our texts, and teach it to us through their drishti, their lens, their way of looking. Most oldest or very old Sanskrit texts, Sanskrit manuscripts were taken to Europe and they have not been returned even now. I don't know why the government never demanded them back. But we have not demanded that all ancient Sanskrit texts we returned and we should archive them, put them in museum, have scholars study them. Nobody has demanded it. And by one estimate there are 500,000 Sanskrit manuscripts sitting outside India. So a whole field of Sanskrit studies, Indian studies, Indology studies started. And I call it Videshi Indology to emphasize that this is a Videshi point of view. It's not our own interpretation. Some of them were very hard working. Some of them were very brilliant. Some of them meant well, trying their best also. It's not that all of them were bad. And it's not that their motives were bad. But the fact is, at the end of the day, they had their point of view because of their own conditioning, their own history, their own philosophy, their own identity. It was very strong in the way they interpreted. So the Adhikar shifted. Instead of our people having the Adhikar to interpret, we were now sitting, literally like the carving shows, sitting at the feet of the Westerner learning about who we are. It's a joke. It's really a disgrace. Now, this went on for a long time. And then every European universities of considerable size started a department of Sanskrit studies because they felt that a lot of treasures existed in Sanskrit texts which they could take and call it their own. They learned grammar from Panini and started developing grammar of European languages. So many things, mathematics, they learned. So much medicine they learned. You see, so the transfer of knowledge through the study of Indology was huge. 
nobody has documented it and talked about it. If someday I get to play a role in writing the history of India, if that were to ever be possible, ever made possible, a large part of what I would propose is to write about the history of Indian influences outside. The history of India is not just one king fighting the other king. What year he fought and who built this monument. That's one part of it. But what did we teach the West or the rest of the world? East Asia, Southeast Asia, Middle East, Europe. Indian influences on the world is a very large part of Indian history. It's not only Indian history, it's not only what happened in the geography of India, but the Indian ideas with whatever they did elsewhere. But this is not the way, even the way we, our people think. They don't think of Indian history as how we civilize the world in some ways, some areas. So this knowledge being sucked out of India went on for a long time. Meanwhile, we were told we are inferior, we have to be civilized. The British are like parents, we are children, they are raising us. It's in our own best interest, we should do whatever they told, whatever we told. So along came the RN theory by Max Miller. No Indian stood up to refute it. We just ignored it. It's a very bad habit. Our tradition says you must do Purva Paksha on the other. Purva Paksha means you study the other. Not shouting, not throwing paint at him, throwing stones at him, abusing him, but in a very respectful way, studying what are they doing. Right? Like in military, you study what is the other side doing. In cricket, you study what, are, what kind of team do they have, what are their strengths. Then you can give a response, the Uttar Paksha. So we have a tradition, for ancient, the oldest debating tradition in the world is Indian. And it, it says you must first study the other, do full function, and understand him so well that you understand him as well as he understands his point of view. Only then you are qualified to give a response. We ignored this. When the early Christians came and settled on the Malabar coast, we did not study Christianity. We just said, okay, there are some people who came, then they can live. But we did not understand them. When the Portuguese came, we did not understand what is this Christianity. When the Muslims came, we did not do a full part of Islam. When Marxism came, when colonialism came, postmodernism came, all these things coming, we, you know our traditional scholars have not, have not done their job because they are sitting in a silo, introverted, talking to each other, and just repeating the same classical texts rather than figuring out what is happening in the world today. Our place in globalization, this is the globalization is the new Kurukshetra. It is the intellectual Kurukshetra. It is the commercial Kurukshetra, political Kurukshetra. We have to understand this Kurukshetra, like Sri Krishna interpreted the Kurukshetra at that time, who these people are, what they are doing, who is doing what. So he is doing the Purupaksha of the other side. So we have to do Purupaksha, but our traditional scholars are not doing it. For that, you must, they must learn English to understand the other side. They must learn the theories, siddhanta, the philosophy of these other people. They must have courage to respond. They must have funding. So I'm trying to use this book as a way to get our team of traditional scholars. This is where I need help from all the Sanskrit places. Any place that is teaching Sanskrit. We want to start a team. One team we are starting in Bangalore, Chennai area. Due to this trip, I was well received by Sanskrit universities and some of our traditional you know, organizations and they want to help create such a team. And another team could start here with Indus University because we have a center for Indian studies, one of the very few and unique centers which is giving a Swadeshi Drishti, not a Videshi Drishti. So here also we could start uh, what I call home team intellectual Kshatriyas who study these things from our point of view. So these intellectual Kshatriyas doing Pur Paksha and giving Uttar Paksha is a very important part of how to how to proceed. So after independence the 
the uh, <coughs> Indology became less in Europe. It did not come here, it went to the United States. It's called South Asian Studies. US government funded it, private people funded it. So this is the Americanization of the Adhikar. Instead of European Adhikar became American Adhikar. So today, you ask any scholar from one of the traditional mathas or, or Sanskrit departments, <coughs> where are the best journals? They tell you they are in USA. Where are the best conferences on, on this field? They are in USA. Where is the best place to get a PhD for your career? You would rather go to USA or Oxford or someplace. So we don't have the best institutional mechanisms for studying our own culture. It's like giving a card to your opponent to study you and sending your own people there. And irony is that a lot of our billionaires are funding this, funding them. <coughs> Not only they're funding them, they're arguing that it's a good thing to do. They are saying that they are better at us at doing this than we are. So if we don't, uh, if we can't do it, we'll, we'll have them do it and it will be better for us. This is, this is, uh, it's like imagine if an army officer were saying that we'll ask Musharraf to run our, run our military academy because he's very good at it. <laughs> and he's a very nice guy. He came here and he told us he'll run it. And he'll even do it for free. And don't worry, we have enough for it. NRI will fund it also. We will, don't worry, we'll take care of it. And it would be a very foolish thing if we decided that that's the right thing to do. But that's what's happening in the field of Indology. Our people are funding the Videshi Indology. Narayan Murthy funding <coughs> IV links to translate our text into English using their drishti, their editorial board, their standard of how you translate certain words. <coughs> Not only that, the traditional scholars that some of your organizations have have not been invited to do a review to even pass comment on whether this work is good or not you don't even count you're sidelined that's pretty ridiculous for it to be so this is loss of adhikar and more worse than the british era because at least indian businessmen were not funding those guys and traditional mathas were not uh, supporting them. But now Indian government giving them Padam Shiris, these, some of these scholars overseas, that they are interpreting us better than we can interpret ourselves, what can we do, sir? So I tell them that if we can be the world leader in IT <coughs> and pharmaceuticals, things like automobile manufacturing, why can't we create the world's best Indic studies? Why can't we? If we don't have it, we can create the capacity, like we did in other areas. So, the uh, people, our ancestors, our ancestors, in places like Naranda, Tachashila, and various other places, were the producers of knowledge. The whole world would send their bright people. We would teach the world. Now we are consumers of knowledge and we are learning from others. So knowledge production is done elsewhere. We learn from it. Even the knowledge about our own civilization, quite a ridiculous state. So I would question whether <coughs> we are truly decolonized. I doubt that we can say we are decolonized. So, this is, uh, this is what this battle for Sanskrit is about. The book is not to teach you Sanskrit. For that you should join Sanskrit Bharati, a good organization and many others. It is not to tell you the greatness and glory of Sanskrit. A lot of people have written on that. But to <coughs> the purpose of the book is to 
inform our own traditional scholars what they don't know about the international discourse on Sanskrit and Sanskriti. So not just Sanskrit, Sanskrit and Sanskriti civilization are intertwined, interrelated. Okay. So at the World Sanskrit Congress about six months ago, I announced this book and the Indians and Thai people, this was in Bangkok, the Thai people, the Southeast Asian people loved it. Then I'm going to talk about how the Adhikar should go back to the traditional people. They all loved it. Many of the Westerners were therefore very angry because they are used to being saluted and you know exalted. And here comes one Indian who is saying that we want to take the Adhikar back. So they started attacking me personally, immediately, making all kind of false allegations, which never, none of them were true, none of them could be there. But they tried to convince the publishers to withdraw it. And it failed because thanks to many people like you, the support from me was very strong. So today we are we have this book, despite all the attempts to stop it. So you could say we won the first battle for Sanskrit already. Because, which means we have the Adhikar to do good much on others, to critique them, to evaluate them on our own terms, to talk about it freely among ourselves, and to want to take this Adhikar back. But big difference, many differences between the British domination era and the American. Any difference. One of them is that unlike the British era, when most of the people doing this Orientalism and ideology were Koras, now we have a very large number of Indians doing this. The Indian left are eating out of their hands all this stuff about why Vedas are confused, Vedas have this problem, Ramayana is abusive, all that they learned. <coughs> And it's become fashionable. It's become fashionable among our people to start propagating this kind of idea. Most of them don't know enough. They don't want to sit down and discuss with me, debate with me. Mainstream media don't want me around. When I'm gone, when I leave, they criticize me behind my back when I can't talk back. So, I'll give you a quick rundown of what are some of the main problems with Western Indology, which I've discussed in this book. One of the main problems, biggest problems, is that they are unhappy with the sacredness because they're secular people, atheistic people. Being atheists, they want to deny the sacredness in Sanskrit, Vedas, Ramayana, texts. They don't like Yagna, they don't like Mantra, they don't like pujas. So they don't like the things that make Sanskrit and Sanskriti so special for us. Not only they remove these things, but they claim that this is socially abusive. It is oppression. It is meant to oppress and exploit your caste. Men want to exploit women by excluding them. This is how Ramayana is being interpreted. This is how Vedas are being interpreted. So, Rather than looking at it through the lens of sacredness, the way we do, they are looking at it through the atheistic lens of human rights. And they have this theory that the spread of Sanskrit was done as a conspiracy by kings to give themselves more political power. So when you perform Ramayana, you respect the king because Ram is a king. So you have blind disobedience, blind obedience to him. Like this is the whole interpretation that they made. That the spread of Sanskrit and Sanskriti is a way to increase the authority, political authority of upper caste elites and exploit the others. So this uh, shift in the way we are being studied is very serious. This is what the whole left is doing. That's the whole ideological point. 
This is subordinate studies. This is feeding the casteism. This is feeding this breaking India forces. The origin of this is the Indological studies in Orientalism that go on in the West and brought to India by <coughs> scholars who quote all this right and left. And the funding of Ford Foundation and other NGO type mechanisms. And all these English speaking slick media people who go around getting the same training. So this knowledge is grown, comes through academic, to Indian academics. It comes through foundations to NGOs for NGO work. It comes through media training, journalism training to our journalists. It comes through various training centers for IAS, IFS officers. They are alienated too. And lately, even the Hindu political establishment parties are being infiltrated. So a lot of so we don't have a we don't have a machinery to even do surveillance, to even to even look out for what who's who, who's right, who's not right. So anybody who comes and says a few shlokas and talks very nicely and beautifully says you are this old civilization, I love you, I want to revive your civilization, we believe it must be so. So this is the the use of Sam and Dharma and hide the bath and dud. Project the Sam and Dan, you know, the, the good stuff, what's positive diplomacy, and hide the bath and dud. This is going on. Now, there's an attack on the oral tradition, which says that the oral tradition is not a useful one, it's a bad one. History starts with writing. So whatever happened before cannot be considered history. This is very mischievous. This is very, very mischievous. Because if you remove the oral tradition, you you discounted a large part of Indian history. Because we have a lot of oral tradition. I mean our music is oral, our dance is oral, so many Sanskrit texts are oral. And Balmiki Ramayana is much older than the date they're giving. They're giving a date after Buddha and they're saying that it was done under the influence of Buddhism. This is very strange. So uh, many issues I have raised in this book and I need people to become educated by reading it. It takes very complicated logic and complicated written works that the people have produced, that scholars have produced and brings it down to a very simple level so average person who can read English can understand what are the main arguments because that's what I want to do is teach the average army English reader in a very straightforward way what are the arguments being used against us how to talk back, how to raise doubt and how to talk back. So the another theory is that Sanskrit is a dead language, it's been dead for a thousand years and Hindu kings killed it. Hindu kings killed it. Some of the Muslims tried to help it but the Hindus would not cooperate. Very very interesting, interesting theory. And then there is this uh, theory that the negative orientalism, the negative uh, these things that Europeans did uh, called Orientalism, which was racist, biased. Actually, they learned it from Sanskrit only. There is a theory that this uh, built in uh, atrocity, tendency to hate and violence against others, was built into the Sanskrit texts. And when the Europeans came and started studying these things, they picked up these ideas and took them. As if Europeans were very nice people and did not have any racism, and we taught them. It's very strange. Including the claim is made that Nazism and the Holocaust of Jews had something to do with their study of Sanskrit texts. So this is a, a very an amazing claim. So the point is that this type of thing is getting worse. And you know, I don't have any personal hatred or animosity towards these scholars. I think they are doing their job. Some of them are very brilliant, very brilliant, hardworking. It's our people who need to give a response and haven't done it. And when I tell, ask these scholars, why is why is, are you not getting a critical response? The answer I get is that look, we haven't stopped the traditional people. They're not doing it. They're not doing it. It's not our job to make them wake up. They're not giving a response. They're not giving a response. What do we do? I mean, it is the traditional scholar who's sleeping, who's not doing the full function. 
sometimes lazy, sometimes scared, some of them are sold out. All it takes is one ticket and a trip, trip to US for a semester, they give them some nice treatment, the fellow comes back totally convinced and converted for the rest of his life. He will always like a dog who's been looking for a treat, wagging his tail and saying, okay, you know, that sort of thing. That's what the Indian left in come. So, uh, this is the, so we have this Make in India project. Why only Make in India manufacturing? Why not Make in India the Indic studies and Sanskrit studies? Why not have the Make in India? How can we just Make in India uh, manufacturing and let them make the Indology about us? Who exploited whom? What is the gender relations? What is all this scholarship coming from somewhere else? All our left wing scholars running there to learn, come back, impress those guys, get their funding. So this is like the whole intellectual apparatus, I would say 80-90% is fed, bred and loyal to this kind of Indology from somewhere else. That is what is happening here. So we are colonized. And uh, I think the decolonization from Britain has been followed by recolonization from the United States intellectually. This is what's going on. So, uh, we, our response needs to be dignified, not angry, calm, thoughtful, very intellectual. And we need to build teams of strong, intellectuals who understand our tradition and who understand enough English to be able to read the other side and interpret them and talk back. And we have to teach them debating skills. We have to teach them media skills. Like that we have to teach them. So this is my goal, this is my project. I've been doing this for 25 years. I've now teamed up with Indus University. I'm very delighted and honored and need help from as many of you as possible. I thank you for listening. I would love to now take some questions. Thank you. Uh, Rajiv, I have a question to you. The whole purpose of this colonization, I think we kind of forgot to mention that. Why is this funding from uh, Western powers, world foundations, NGOs? What is the ultimate, ultimate goal to occupy the mind, thinking, and uh, able to speak <coughs> on our behalf without being given uh, yes. Yes. the entire yes. What that's, is the, what that's is the great. final that's, agenda? Yeah. You see, there is a civilizations are expansionist. Islamic civilization has a history, West has a history of expanding. And we don't. We don't have this going around the world expanding and so on. Uh, we never did, even when we were materially stronger than others and militarily stronger, we could have done it, but we chose not to. Because we have not engaged in expansionism, many of our, most of our people don't understand why somebody would be expansionist. But that's their fact. We can say they should not be, but they are. It's in their DNA, it's in their character, it's in their history, they've been expansionist since the beginning. So, Pele used to be expansion only with armies and then economic exploitation. But this is the age of media, knowledge, identity, team. You can expand by giving ideas, by manipulating what people are taught, by making them fight each other, by making them disloyal to their own country, by making them more loyal to some global nexus than to their own country. So, expansion now has become a kind of a mind game, a mind war. A lot of, uh, you know, you see Al Jazeera is a very great Islamic media around the world, not just here, but in the US everywhere, trying to uh, influence young minds. And you see the church doing that with their propaganda. You see US uh, in Afghanistan, the same CIA guy who play soccer with the boys to influence them to be able to make a soccer team for you. Same guy maybe in night he's doing bombing with the
problems are whatever. But these two sides are the same thing. I mean, there is the hard power, and then there is the soft power. Soft power is through culture, through funding, through you know influencing people's ideas. So in this war of ideas, that is where I'm, I mean, I'm involved to educate our people about this war of ideas. So this war of ideas often take comes first to create a base of support on somebody else's wavelength. Then they become loyal to that other place. One day they can even be turned against you politically and uh, militarily. Some people say it's already happening. I think it is already happening. So this, uh, the, the colonization of Indian minds is a very old, few centuries old game. And it is not just limited to India. It is also happening to other countries. They all do this to each other. One very interesting fact is that during the British era, the British recruited Indian sepoys to fight for them very successfully. A large 90 some percent of the soldiers in the British army here were Indians. The firing by soldiers in Jallianwala Park, the General Dyer gave the command, but the actual firing was by the Indians. Most bullets fired against Indians under British command were, were, were by Indian soldiers fighting against each other. Fighting, fight, fighting against their fellow Indians. 111 wars, according to one expert, were fought by the British using Indian soldiers. 111 wars through this 2 300 year period. But during a brief rule they had, brief period of occupation in China, they failed to raise even one regiment. Chinese would not sell out. That is why they never colonized China. They wound up and left because they said these guys are not going to sell out. India is a better place. Indians will work for us. Chinese will not work for us. They could not get Chinese to join an army under British command. And in India they wouldn't do it. So there's something deep in our character, maybe inferiority complex or something. So this these are some of the reasons that are feeding and encouraging the others because you know they're getting a lot of mileage. They're converting our people rapidly. Huge population of confused Hindus ready to give up and go this way that way. And lot at stake. If India were left alone by all these forces, they worry that it might become another China. One China is bad enough for them. Yeah, because it's huge. Now the, the biggest problem is, of course, radical Islam and along, along with it, China. What to do? So suppose if they go to another China, India, then what to do? So it's better to keep it divided. Better to keep people confused. Better to get some of the people fighting the others. It's good. So the strategic consequences of all this colonialization of Indians is big. And you know, in the big scheme of things, it's only a few billion dollars. You know, it's a tiny percentage of the total budget of these people. So if they can spend a tiny portion to kind of intellectually co-opt, appropriate, buy out our people, our intellectuals, and infiltrate many institutions, and have be able to push the button and create a problem somewhere, then it's a good leverage they have over us. They cannot do this in China. They cannot. There is no Ford Foundation, there is no Western ideology type of... China studies is controlled by the Chinese. In Mandarin, they have the journals. In China, Chinese people are on the editorial board. Many of them are military people or intelligence people or government people and corporate people are funding it. Uh, same, Japan, Japan studies is studied in Japan, not in... The control is not anywhere else. Korea studies is in Korea. Arabic studies is in the Arabic language. Germans in their own country. Persian studies is dominated in Iran. Russian studies is in Russia. Only India studies is outside. This is very, very strange that we have this uh, situation. Thank you very much. Give your name and question. So my name is Rajiv Kubit. And uh, I have a question. Uh, which is a kind of so 
we see lot of praise for non-violence. We are taught non-violence now. But don't you think that our sacred scriptures actually praise war and violence in one way or the other? So, our sacred scriptures praise defense of dharma against the dharma. And the method to be used has to be appropriate to even Kurukshetra. So if the Kurukshetra requires violence, you have to use violence. Because you have to defend them. If the Kurukshetra requires a big argument you can win, you use that. So I think Ahimsa has been misunderstood. If you want, Ahimsa is firstly, firstly Himsa. And Ahimsa is opposite of that. Himsa is not just violence, but harming. Harming. When I do cultural abuse to you, I am doing Himsa. It is not just physical violence, it's also emotional, psychological, intellectual violence. So when I go and convert you, when I destroy your culture, when I destroy your way of life, I am doing himsa. So a himsa would also mean defending our culture, defending our way of life, defending our sanskriti. That is part of a himsa. So whether it, so sometimes you kill one man to save a thousand people that he is going to kill. That is, so you are doing a himsa because you are maximizing the saving of lives. Okay. So if you kill Bin Laden because he's about to kill million people, you are doing ahimsa because you save those million people. You see, so ahimsa doesn't mean that unconditional one we don't kill anybody. It means that you you take the actions necessary for the maximum collective good of everybody collective. So if one person has to be punished to help others. You have to do it, and you also have to keep in mind the ahimsa being done, which is against cultures and civilizations, languages faiths, traditions, spirituality, all that is himsa also. And so therefore, the rejection of that himsa and whatever it takes to fight against that himsa is part of the ahimsa. Rajivji, Namaskar. Uh, my name is Pramod Joshi. And uh, I have a question. I have heard and uh, you know, read that many scholars and intellectuals have said that the language Sanskrit was actually monopolized by Brahmins. And it was a way of excluding the masses from access to knowledge, education, etc. Is that correct? So, in this book, I have a whole chapter. Chapter 4, you should read of this book, which is the, it, the allegation that Sanskrit is oppressive. Chapter 4, and I have given an answer into the chapter 4. Chapter 4 is Sanskrit and Sanskriti considered a source of oppression. That is where this comes. It's about 40 page chapter. So, you should read this. I, I do the Puru Paksh of summarizing all their arguments and then my Uttar Paksh giving the response. Thank you. But the bottom line is, I argue that Sanskrit is not oppressive but liberating. So one of the three questions on the cover, is Sanskrit political or sacred? They say it's political, I say it's sacred. Oppressive or liberating? They say it's oppressive, which is a question, and I say it's liberating. Dead or alive? So these are three questions. theory on what is the problem with the human condition, what is the solution. So the Christians have this idea that uh, original sin is the problem. There was original sin and all of you are sinners. There is only one solution that is Jesus Christ because he was sacrificed and he did all these things to save you. So you have to, if you want to be saved from original sin and eternal hell, hell that's the way. Muslims have their own theory of why there is suffering and what is the solution. We have a theory of how avidya and how different things cause suffering and moksha, what is the liberation. So there are different theories of the problem and different solutions they all have. So according to their theory, uh, peace is the long term for the whole world outcome of 
jihad. So they're fighting for jihad because once all the infidels are gone, there will be peace. But of course, we know that if the infidels are gone, then they'll fight uh, the Shiite and Sunnis. And then the Sunnis will fight who's more clean, clearer Sunnis. And similarly, in the Christian world, this fighting for peace has never produced peace in their history. There has never produced peace. So these are also a play of words. I don't blame these aggressive religions, the people in these aggressive religions, because they're born and raised to think a certain way. I really blame the leftists and atheists who are hypocrites. They are, they are really hypocrites. Because they are not born and raised in one of those religions. They are, they are pretending to have made a very independent, objective evaluation. And they are the ones who are deluding us more. When a Christian fundamentalist is trying to say something to you very openly and, 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 and in a very honest way telling you that this is what he believes, at least you are on guard, you know that this is who he is. But the very slick, slippery, Secular leftists trying to talk you into something is more dangerous because he's pretending that he's really not doing anything uh, from a vested interest. He's trying to do something very neutral and objective. So I think this this kind of a gross misrepresentation uh, of uh, violent, aggressive sort of religions and, and expansionist religions is done by the secular left. Now, now the recipe, the principle I advocate is called mutual respect, mutual respect, not unconditional one-way respect, not that I respect you even if you're killing me, no, mutual respect means I respect you for being different whoever you are, whatever your faith, whatever your belief, but mutual means I demand you have to be like that towards me, I demand respect and I give you respect, this if the world were to carry out, we can each be our own way. Nobody is under pressure, but we all respect each other. That is a better solution than uh, going after infidels and expanding and things like that. Do they really wish the world to be peace? Do they? Those are the things are peaceful. Yeah. See, yes, sir. Yeah. See, I don't have access to the mind of Jesus or Mom. I don't. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. So my access is through the people I see today. And I can evaluate, I can evaluate the human beings interpreting them. Maybe they are interpreting wrong also. Who knows? Maybe they're they are misinterpreting what somebody else may have said. So I cannot evaluate the founder because I never met him and I have no access to interview him. He doesn't have a website. They don't take phone calls. They have no mobile. I, I don't know what to think. This is the problem with history centric, which means history is closed. History is closed. There is no more, uh, no more ruling, no more shuddhi, there is no more uh, enlightened masters like in our tradition. We have enlightened masters in every era. You can ask the enlightened master. He will tell you. He is the expert. He will tell you. But in those traditions, there are no living enlightened masters. Even the Pope is not an enlightened master. He is a CEO. He is more a Kshatriya. He is not a enlightened being. They don't claim that he's an enlightened being. Yeah. So, uh, and the Imam doesn't claim, does not claim that he has the same experience as Muhammad. They don't, it's considered wrong, it's considered blasphemy. Whereas in our case, the enlightened Guru has the direct embodied knowledge without depending on quoting a text as something that happened a thousand years ago. He has his own embodied knowing. He has access to this knowledge. So, uh, therefore, in the, in the case of a doubt in our tradition, I can seek out a master and I can resolve the question. But in the case of what was the knowledge of in some of these other religions, we don't have that access. We can just see what human beings are doing today and we can evaluate whether we agree with them or not. That's all we can do. Uh, Namaskar Rajivji, my name is Ashdur Jani. This is a popular opinion that मनस्मृति है चाणक्य नीति है ये ग्रंथों में स्त्रियों और जो लोअर कास्ट के लोग जिन्हें माना जाता है उनके लिए काफी एट्रोसिटीज वाली बातें लेके गई हैं जो जब ऐसी डिबेट नहीं पे चलती है तो इसके ऊपर क्लेरिफिकेशन कैसे दिया जाए सो वन ऑफ द क्वेश्चन इज मनस्मृति चाणक्य और गॉडलीज कौटिल्या मेनी ऑफ द स्मृतिज 
uh, are accused of uh, human rights violations against uh, lower caste and against women and so on. First of all, smritis can be changed. Smritis are supposed to be changed. They're human constructions, not unlike Shruti, and they can be changed. Just you can change them, modify them, or that. So different paramparas, different uh, sampradayas interpret the text differently. Even today, if you want to ten sampradayas, they don't have all the same rules. They're different, and we can keep changing them, keep evolving them. So the idea that somebody in the past wrote something we don't like, we can change it. It is not a defeat of the whole faith, of the whole tradition. It is not that Hinduism has to defeat it. Because Manu himself says that you have to interpret this according to the Desh, according to the Kaal. You know, what is good in the north may not be good in the south, what is good in one jati may not be good in another jati, and what is good in the past may not be good today, in the future. He himself is very clear. He is mentioning this many, many times. So, to say that this is some kind of a universal, permanent, eternal, final thing is, is a projection of Abrahamic religion because they have this one book, final close, you can't ever, ever change it. We don't have that system. So this is the first point. Whatever is wrong, we don't like it today, we have every right to change it. If we are not changing it, it's our laziness. Okay, Manu did what he did for his era. So, and the law, second thing is, a lot of uh, flexibility existed in Jati and Varna, a lot of flexibility is it. I give in this book a response to this allegation, chapter 4 again, a response to this allegation I give. And you should read that. And I show that there were Shudra dynasties of kings. A lot of famous people were Shudras. A lot of switching of Varna from one Varna to the other based on merit. A person could fall, a person could go, depending on their merit, their, their actual karma, they could. So it is not something necessarily by birth. And even in the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says that your varna is determined by your karma and your guna. He doesn't say it is by your parents' karma. He doesn't say that. He says your. Which means you and your past life, future life as one continuous uh, being. Your karma keeps developing into your varna. So, and I remember uh, Prabhupada in the 70s, early 70s. I used to, I used to live in Michigan, and the best place to have a great meal was the Iskcon Temple. So I used to go with some friends, and we used to have a wonderful meal. So I really got very much into the Iskcon at the time, and so I got to know Prabhupada. He was such an amazing person. So somebody asked him, "What do you think of uh, caste?" So he gave an interesting answer, which I really liked. He said, in our Iskon, everybody starts Shudra and then they work their way up. So first, we give them kitchen work, cleaning work, gardening work, manual work. That's the first work. Because the person is not ready for it more. And if they can't handle it, they leave, they leave. Those who are very good, they mastered that. Then they go sell books, that is Vashya. They go to the street and sell books, raising money. So ISKCON people used to be in airports, Hare Krishna, ding, 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 and raise this money. Do you hear the book? Please take it. Could I have some dollars? I, I thought they were doing really, they really thought about these things. So these are Vaishya, fundraising. Then some of them are leaders. So they may become in charge of something, political in terms of like corporate governance, team leaders, in charge of the cleaning crew, in charge of the kitchen crew, in charge of the partition department in charge, so they are kind of leaders, they are Kshatriyas. Very few would then rise to be the people who can interpret, interpret the whole theory and go and teach. So that would be the Shabramin. So he said in my organization, it is entirely on merit and everybody start at the bottom and work to whatever level you can. Nobody comes and immediately installed as a Brahmin who goes around giving lectures. I thought it was very interesting. So you see, that parampara has its own view. You go to Ramakrishna mission, they have no caste idea. You go to Chitmaya mission, they have no caste idea. You go to Art of Living. I mean, a lot of them don't. Uh, Kanchi Chakracharya doesn't believe in that. Shingiri Chakracharya does. So it's a, you know, there are different interpretations. So it's not like all Hinduism is like this, firstly. Nor is it permanently stuck in something you have a right to change, even as per tradition. You're not committing blasphemy if you say I, I, 
and this uh, and dissent in a life change. A lot of people, the Bhakti poets did it, so many people did it. So, um, and then if you look historically, it has not always been fixed in a certain way. So when you look at it with all these, these caveats, it is nowhere close to what it is accused of. Now, having said that, I will say we have social problems. We Hindus have, and we should solve them. No denying that. But there are social problems in the United States with, with uh, racism and with this problem and that problem, and there are social problems in all these kind of countries. There are social problems in China. Uh, you know, there are different communities and there are social harm Chinese and the superior and the others are not, and so on. So, I think every community has to solve its problems in a very honest, fair way. There is no reason to import somebody else's solution. My only problem is when the foreigners have, when the Western people have a danda, that you we go to put this danda on you, we're going to accuse you, we're going to put sanctions on you and all that. And they haven't solved these problems in their own country. That to me is is a kind of a, uh, well, it is a, a double-faced hypocrisy. Because once I did a, I hired some students to do a summer internship. We took uh, statistics from the United Nations on various social abuses, you know, crimes, and social abuses, uh, crimes against women, abuse of children, uh, number of uh, childless births, I mean, uh, births out of, out of, without marriage, you know, uh, those unwed mothers, drug addiction, violence, crime, all of that rapes. So we took all the statistics for different countries and we scaled them per million population. Because you cannot say 100 crimes in India is equal to 100 crimes in a small country because the population is small. So per million population we scaled it. And then we looked at ranking, okay, the UN statistics. And we clustered the Christian countries which were previously colonies. So we are not comparing, you know, Philippines, Philippines the colony. We want to be compared with that because we were also a colony. It would be unfair to compare them with the rich European country, right? So we took the cluster of Christian countries that were previously colonies, that their social statistics and crime statistics far, far worse than India. We looked at Muslim countries as non oil, oil producing, huge crime problem. So you cannot say that these problems are for cause of Hinduism. And so what I tell these agencies is go and solve the problem first in your own Christian countries. If you can solve the problem, I'll be a consumer, I'll buy it, I'll buy your solution. But if your solution doesn't work in the, at home, then why are you selling it to me? Yeah, how it? That's my problem. Uh, Namaste Rajiv ji, uh, big fan. Uh, now, uh, what I observe is that uh, in, like, uh, people like uh, Devdutt Patnayak, you know, they are like uh, sympathizers or knowers of Dharma and basically they are uh, children, uh, they are uh, students of the likes of Wendy Ronegar or Sheldon Paul. They are children. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and my, 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 uh, when I wrote this book 10 years ago called Invading the Sacred, Rupa put it on press, they no longer published. It's the first book I educated people to critique of Wendy Ronegar and all her sampradaya and parampara. She was unknown to Indians. Nobody knew. People were asking, like today, children Pollock is not known, but in two years he'll become very well known. I tell you that because of her whole country. So similarly, Wendy Donald was not known. And there was no disrespect meant for her. I was just critiquing their work. That's all. And I wanted them to kind of discuss it. So that book went out of print. And uh, some publisher in Delhi is coming up with a reprint of my original writings. My original writings on this whole Wendy Donald thing. And, and they're going to call it Wendy's children. So these are Wendy's children. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, in the if you look at the mainstream media, they, like obviously uh, there's scholarly debate going on. That's a separate thing. But the mainstream media and books like you know Devdutt Patnaik uh, writes seven secrets of Vishnu or Shiva and gives his own interpretation. Now I'm not a scholar on Dharma. I'm just a missing Hindu. Now if I look at his books, they uh, they seem to be like you know sugar for me. Absurd. The interpretation is very absurd, and any of the uh, uh, revered dharma scholars here can make up just from two pages of it. Now, how do we counter this? So, part of the work that my 
proposed uh, traditional scholars home team should do is to pick on people like take on people like Devdas for that who are flooding all the airport shops with their books and everybody is uh, inviting them to TV shows and literary festivals and they are sort of like Mr. Uh, Hinduism right there. Okay. So our traditional scholars with the uh, who have authority who, who are standing ought to take things on and write critiques and we will popularize those critiques and burst that balloon because this fraud and fake and infiltrating is more dangerous than somebody who is fighting very openly. This is like infiltrating you, claiming to speak on your behalf but actually undermining you. Very dangerous. I'm glad you picked it up. Uh, yeah, I would also uh, love to support destroying the Andhavad project. You should call talk to uh, indigenous people and join the Andhavad project. I think uh, the more people join the Andhavad project, the better. We need at least three teams. One is scholars who can read who can read a certain uh, material and give you a, a, a traditional response and critical analysis. That is one kind of person. Second is somebody who is English speaking, good English, writes, can repackage this and put it out into all kinds <coughs> of material, like make documentaries. They should make documentaries <coughs> responding to some of these myth wallets. Documentary all that. Uh, third is social media and these people who just make a lot of noise. But we need noise makers also. So we should have these different teams. <coughs> and people who want to join the Ahmedabad team should contact the university and just create a team. My question is, what is our sacred text that we have created? Is there no power in it that the people who read it, they will change it. 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 तो क्या वो उपनिषद का प्रश्न उपनिषद पढ़ा उसने तो वो मैं सारे उपनिषद पढ़ा उसके बाद क्या उसके मन में परिवर्तन नहीं होगा देयर इज अ कमेंट एंड अ क्वेश्चन द क्वेश्चन इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट वन कमेंट आई डिसएग्री विद दिस कमेंट इज दैट मैक्स मिलर वाज अ लवर ऑफ इंडिया फैन ऑफ इंडिया फैन ऑफ इंडिया तो वेरी नॉन इज अ फैन ऑफ इंडिया दे आर फैन ऑफ इंडिया ब्रिटिश वर फैन ऑफ इंडिया ब्रिटिश वर फैन ऑफ इंडिया देयर आईडिया वाज दैट दे आर हियर टू सिविलाइज यू दे आर हियर टू सिविलाइज यू हम आपके मां-बाप हैं आपको वी आर रेजिंग यू प्रॉपर्टी या British said, the British Orientalist said, your present is like our past and your future is our present. Matlab, what we were, you have chhod gaye, bachpan mein, bachche the, that is how you are today. You are a bachcha, hum bachche the, and how we are now as adults is your future. So we are, we know where you are going. We will take you. Of course, they were fans and lovers of India. No, uh, nobody openly talks that we hate you. Nobody. We are we are foolish people. That who care about any tarif karna mere ko itna inferiority complex that I am so happy and flattered. Wo to he knows that this is your weakness. To walk or he will constantly keep flattering you. And all the people I am criticizing in this book, not one of them is is happy with my calling them homophobic. But that is what their writings are. They don't. They will always say we love Hinduism. They always say that. But you know, it has all these problems, and the sacredness is not really genuine. And you see, it was done for political purposes. So, who made it? What happened? It's like the person who uh, archaeologist who says, "What a beautiful painting." Who sacred painting is not there? Of course, he's a fan of the painting. But according to me, he's demising the sacredness, and therefore he's undermining it. So, I, I don't. Uh, Consider Max Weber. He started the Aryan theory, which is the single most dangerous thing happening in Indian society: the Dravidian separatism and the Dravidian divide. How can you say the fan of India when he created such a horrible thing for us? And towards the end, he writes in a letter that the reason I'm doing all of this is to show them the superiority of Christianity. This is a letter by Max Weber. Please read that before you say that he's a great fan of India. Upper the upper side of the thumb. Now, the real Question you ask very serious, very good question. Ki are the Vedic texts not powerful enough to convince anybody who reads them? Are the Vedic texts lack of power? So even after reading them, studying them, understanding them, the person is still uh, uh, not not a good person, not able to become sacred. You see, you have to ask why was Ravana that way after doing so much tapasya? And after reading the text, you see, the intellectual needs to be a good person. 
the person who's got a lot of intellectual knowledge, even got Siddhis, may actually be quite a wicked person. The Kauravas and Pandavas, you can't say that war with her dharma is because those guys were not knowledgeable. They were very, very intelligent. But it, the whole idea of Avidya is such that you could have a lot of theoretical knowledge, a lot of intellectual knowledge. It hasn't transformed your consciousness. And you have this knowledge, you may actually be going against it. You may actually be a destructive person after understanding the knowledge. I think this is a very important question because a lot of our people say, you, uh, as long as the person is speaking Sanskrit and he knows a lot, he'll be a good person. That is not so. That is, uh, in this book, in the very first chapter, I respond to this question. Some Sanskritists ask me, how can I be accused of hating the tradition when I spent my whole life studying it? And I say, the microbiologist studies a bacteria all his life to get rich of killing. <laughs> yeah. People who are considered Islamophobic in the Western Academy, Islamophobic means of the age of Islam. They are some of the, they have studied, they and night have studied, studied Islam, what's going on, what's going on, in order to hate it, in order to bring it down. In the Cold War, uh, CIA had a lot of Russian language experts uh, to understand the opposing side. Not because you love it, because you want to understand it. Every, I'm sure in Indian army and in Indian raw, there must be Pakistan experts who know the language, who read every paper, who go and talk to them very nicely with their spies. Not because they want to love them, but because they want to bring them down and say, they must have such people for us. So, watching the other and studying a text, understanding it, does not necessarily translate into loving it. It's a very naive view our people have. They are very tilak, sari me aate hai. How can you, sir, say nahi hai You know how much the Christian evangelists go to temples and behave like this very nicely. Bohut bohut karte, drama karte, bohut drama karte. So do not be fooled that just because a person is studying our text, therefore he is in love with it. It's a very big mistake commonly made. Thank you. Thank you.